Jesus Christ. Why? Because He's King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's the only Savior whereby you and I have been saved forever. And we give Him the glory and honor and praise. So as we get into the Word today, I want to talk about the preaching of the cross. And I want to bring up here where we have a quote from Andrew Womack. Because this quote, I do believe, establishes what many of us sometimes don't believe. Do you have that, Jess? It was the second slide up there, but regardless, whether you have it or not, if you find it, that's good. But primarily what he was saying is that people today don't really believe in the grace message. They are offended by the cross. This is the apostasy of the church that I was talking about. This is what's going on today, and you and I are currently witnesses of that. We direct people back to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whereby Jesus Christ has saved us, as I mentioned. He sealed us by His Holy Spirit. He's keeping us in every aspect. He lives within us. We have eternal life currently abiding in our hearts and lives. And I want you to look at this in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Look at the 18th and then we'll jump to the 24th verse. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter 18. I want you to realize that you need a surety of your salvation. You need to know as a matter of fact that you absolutely can't earn this. I remember, as I used an illustration before, I was in the Atlanta airport. If anyone's ever flown into Atlanta, you realize when you go from one terminal to the other, you're going underground on a train. When you come up, you've got an escalator that probably go further from this floor to that peak of this roof, maybe past that. And I had a situation where I was, I left my computer up there in security. I was trying to get back to it. I was trying to get it back, and I started running up the wrong way of the escalators to get there because I didn't know any other way to try to get there. And so I was running. I mean, I gave it all I've got. Those escalators are coming down. I'm going up. That's exactly what you're doing when you're trying to work your way to God. You're going up an escalator that's coming down. You're trying your best to run up something to get to the top, to please Him, to be accepted by Him, and all you're doing is losing ground faster than you're gaining it. But I'll never forget one person looking over another escalator, and they were about halfway even with me, and they looked over and said, when I finally gave up and started just, I'll take you the rest of the way down, I found the right way. It was an easy way up to where my computer was, and I was able to get it back. He looked over and says, I thought you were going to make it. <laughs> he knew I was giving it the best try I could possibly give it. I thought you were going to make it. That's the way it is in the Christian life. We think we're going to make it. We exhaust ourselves. We'll die trying. I'll show God that I'm the most faithful person that he's ever called to salvation. And God is telling us, you're not going to make it. You're not accepted by your works in any way possible. Understand it is a surety that you need, an assurance that you need to know that you're secure in Christ Jesus. Simply rest in him. It's not about you. It's not about what you've done. It's not about what you're doing. And so therefore, it's not about what the other person is doing. Or not about what the person has done. Andrew Womack says this, Those who preach what must be done to earn salvation are always offended. Are always offended. You guys are making this way too easy. It can't be this easy. If it wasn't this easy, none of us would ever be saved. It says, Offended at the preaching of the cross, Jesus paid it all. No amount of suffering on man's part could produce salvation. You might say, well, I understand that, Pastor. But hold on. We're going someplace today. And I want you to realize the apostasy of the church is getting away from the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not a blood-centered salvation anymore. We're going to talk about something that's less gruesome than that. No, our Savior had to come down here and give His own life on the cross of Calvary to redeem us back to Himself. Through that blood... What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Absolutely nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can reconcile you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can redeem you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can sanctify you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can justify you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you righteous? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's about the blood of Jesus if you ain't got that by now. 1 Corinthians 1.18 Paul says to the church of Corinth, for the preaching of the cross is of them that perish Foolishness, he says, but to us, which are saved, it is the power of God. 
there demonstrated on Mount Calvary was a full and complete plan of salvation that Jesus Christ endured all of this in your behalf and mine. Now, all my sins are washed away. Every one of them have been forgiven. None of them are to be remembered against me anymore. God says, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. They're gone. Taken away. And who reminds him of our sins? We do. Oh, Lord, please forgive me for what I did today. So what we're doing is we're questioning the fact that he actually did something about it. God, you didn't really take away all my sin because I don't feel like it on the inside. Therefore, I'm coming back to you and asking you to literally forgive me of my sin. And God just impressed me with this, and we'll get into it. He said to Moses, when it came time when they were in the wilderness in the desert, I want you, he said, to go out there and smite the rock, which was a picture of Jesus Christ, whereby when he smote the rock, water came out of the rock, and it was wells of living water that was able to take care of not only the people, but all their livestock. The second time it happened, same wilderness, and there they were crying out, Moses, why did you bring us out here? We're going to perish here in this wilderness. He found out the second time, he says, I want you to go speak to the rock, don't smite the rock. Moses went out there and said, you... People, you rebels, he says, what, must we smite this rock or must we cause water to come out of this rock? And the Bible says he smote the rock the second time because he didn't count it to be done the first time. It was a picture of Jesus. First time, Jesus Christ was smitten. After that, speak to the rock. So guess what, church? In the apostasy state we're in, we don't speak to the rock. We keep smiting the rock, smite the rock, smite the rock. God forgive, God forgive, God forgive. It makes me feel better, God, if I ask you. God says you're smiting the rock. The second time, the third time, the fourth time, until finally he says, you know what, Aaron, you know what, Moses? You're not going in the promised land. You know why? Because the law, none of your efforts, nothing that you do, now you're not even part of this as far as applying, uh, applying a, a plan of salvation. You're not even part of this as far as taking the people into the promised land. Jehovah. Joshua, Yeshua, he said, we'll take you into the promised land. And that is old covenant wilderness, new covenant promised land. That's where you and I currently are in. I'm in the promised land. I don't have to wait to the sweet by and by. Right now, I'm in the promised land because of Yeshua. And there was Moses crying out, Lord, but please, God, please, you know, let me go in. And God says, you can go up on the top of Mount Horeb, and you can look out, he says, over to the promised land, but you won't go in it. And in fact, he said to him in Deuteronomy 3, he says, I will hear you no more concerning this matter. Don't bring it up. Now, God said, I will hear you no more as far as the law being able to receive the promises of God. It cannot happen. So you can keep beating that dead horse. You can keep going down that road. But you will not enjoy the promises of God through the law. They come, he says, this promise... He says, declaring it through Jesus Christ, that's the only way you receive all these blessings in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every single one of them. God owns everything. God says He don't only own a cattle upon a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He owns everything. And He says, all these blessings come freely through the work of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Not through you and I laboring. Oh, you know, I've got to go out there and work hard. I've got to make sure that I do this in order to be able to have my provisions, everything met that I need. No, God says it's all met through Jesus Christ our Lord. Quit struggling. Start resting in Christ Jesus. Don't try to run up the escalator the wrong way. Just go ahead and stop on the escalator. Let it take you down or up, whichever way you're going. And God's going to be the one that declares to you the blessings of Jesus Christ are upon you. He's Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen? Look at what he says here in the 24th verse. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Understand this is for Jews and Gentiles. For the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Christ is the power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God. You and I have living on the inside of us the power of God and the wisdom of God, a free gift through Jesus Christ. Look at what he says here. And I've used this scripture many times, so I'm kind of blowing through these because I want to get somewhere. He tells us, no flesh should glory in his presence. 
See, people feel pretty good about themselves. I feel good about myself and the fact that, you know, I, I had a pretty good day yesterday. You know, I, I was coming Friday morning. I was uh, at uh, an auto place, and I bought two cases of oil, and I had both in my hand, and I went to throw them in the back of my truck, and one of them broke. And it hit, the cardboard broke loose in my hand. It hit right side up and landed perfectly on the ground. I looked over to a guy that worked for the, uh, the municipality of New Coventry, and I said, it's going to be a good day. He says, you're right. That thing landed right side up, didn't it? I, but God was already telling me that before. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day because i got a good, good Savior. Amen? That's what God is telling us all the time. And he goes on to say this, that no flesh will ever glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. You and I are in Christ, and Christ is in us. That's our identity. Our identity, like I've been talking about recently, but haven't gone into it fully, you need to identify yourself with who God says you're identified with. I'm a child of the Most High God. That will certainly lift you up. You know what? I'm greatly loved. I'm greatly favored. I'm tremendously blessed in every aspect of life. I'm already heaven bound. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I've got the Holy Spirit living in me. He's the one that has sealed me. I'm the child of God forever. I'm just walking here in a place called earth. I'm going to be walking in a place called heaven, or I'm going to be with Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where I am. I know Jesus is with me. That's all that matters. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All these things given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us on the Mount Calvary, whereby it was done one time and one time for all. 31st verse says this, he says that according as it is written, he that glorieth. You want to glory? You want to shout? You people of God? He says you want to point people in the right direction? Let's glory in the Lord. Amen? We will only glory in the Lord. Let him glory, he says, in the Lord. Now I want to tell you about your surety for a moment. Because we're people, when we know our surety, when we know our assurance. I know back in 1997 I was wearing a shirt called Eternal Security. It looked like, you know, security, like you're part of a security force. And then it had smaller letters, Eternal Security. There were people sometimes that mocked me about that. Oh, eternal security. But you know what? It's so funny because the Bible tells us in John 5, 24, a scripture that all of us know, it's up here on the screen. John 5, 24 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, right now, has everlasting life. Now, the last time I checked, everlasting means everlasting. It means forever and ever. It means eternal. It means it doesn't end. It means that you have it from now on out. I have eternal life abiding within me. Just think about that. Meditate upon that. It's not a temporary reprieve to the next time that I mess up. I was reading through another covenant that my, my son brought to my attention last night. And I was doing some studying on it because I wasn't familiar with this and then found out some things regarding it. And basically, without getting into it today, it was talking about the fact that you could be kicked out of the house of God. If you didn't obey the rules, you'd be kicked out of the house of God. I, I want to ask you something. I mean, how many of us are, are obeying all the rules? Do we even know all the rules? I don't think so. If you want to go down to the 611 different laws regarding ceremonial, moral, civil laws. I mean, is all of it covered? Has it been covered? Is there every sin of commission and omission? Is everything been confessed? Is everything straightened out? Do you feel good about yourself? Point him in the direction of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from what? Death to life. I have already passed from that dead state. I'm now alive in Jesus Christ. Never, he says, to die. I'm a child of God. Now, physical death is one thing. Spiritual death is another thing. I will never suffer spiritual death. I may have suffered a physical death if the Lord tarries long enough, which I don't expect him to. You know, God, you already promised me that I'm going to be the generation that shall see the coming of the Lord. Why? Because I saw the parable of fig tree. Because I'm living in Matthew 16. I can discern the signs of the times because of exactly what took place. Jesus Christ declared that Israel would be brought back into their homeland. Something that never happened before is happening now. Look at this next scripture with me, please. It says here in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you have right now, he says, everlasting life, you are eternally saved in Christ Jesus. Amen? I said amen. Praise God. 
Thank you, Jesus. Now we're going to get into 2 Thessalonians 2. As I mentioned in our Ford, you might say, uh, you know, I've had people talk about me about the Reformation. Well, nothing has to be reformed if you're going back to the original gospel, which is the first century. Something has to be reformed if you're going by what Martin Luther said as far as that 95, 96 thesis he nailed to Wittenberg, uh, Germany's door when he took offense at the faith that was, he was involved in. My point is this. The apostasy of the church takes place when you start smiting the rock. Second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time. I'm going to smite the rock every single day. I'm never going to count the work. I'm never going to agree with Jesus. I'm never going to say along with Jesus that it's finished. It's finished, people. It's done. He's provided a full and complete plan. He's given you total forgiveness. He's given you everlasting life. He's given you the Holy Spirit. What else can He give you? He's given you everything. Receive it. Enjoy it. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. This is the second letter to the church of Thessalonica after He spent nine days with them. Two weekends and Monday through Friday. That's it. And now they're concerned. Oh, man, you know, all the things that are going on. We must have missed the rapture. We're now in tribulation. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ, he says, is at hand or has already come, as one translation says. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. So right away, people start measuring themselves to say, have I fallen away? Was I closer at one time? If I'm not as close as I was, then I've obviously fallen away. I'm part of the falling away. No. He's talking about the apostasy of the church. He says, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, he says, the son of perdition. Now, the Bible only speaks about the son of perdition two times. Two places. The Antichrist is a son of perdition. And who else? Judas is the son of perdition. That's it. Some people say, well, I mean, I remember one time a tract I saw up in Lancaster. It was a good and plenty, and I had somebody in the church come to me and said, well, you know, there's a uh, tract that says that, that Judah, Judas, he was saved, and then he was lost. No, the Bible never says he was saved. He was the son of perdition from, from the very beginning. You see that in Psalms. Son of perdition. And so here we have, he says, speaking of the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to go into the rebuilt Jewish temple. He's going to set himself down. He's going to declare himself to be God. Every single person shall worship me. He is the anti-God. He is the anti-Christ. He is not the Christ. Now Jesus said, there's one coming. He says that will come in his own name. Him you will believe and follow. I come in my Father's name, and you don't believe me or you don't follow me. Total ignorance. Now, I find out in the Word of God that he says, he that is ignorant, let him be ignorant. You're not going to convince him otherwise. Because I already mentioned, you can plant, you can water, but it takes God to give the increase. If you want a breakthrough in somebody's life, you realize this can take God to bring the breakthrough. It's going to take God to break through that darkness. It's going to take the light of God to enter in. He did it for you. He did it for me. He'll do it for them. We're going to pray for people. We're going to speak to people about the love of God. I did it this past week again where I work. I was ministering to one person, and we had some discussions, and I'm not going to get into them, as far as even what goes on with the civil rights movement and things of that nature. And I basically was telling him about Jesus Christ being the way, truth, and life, and there is one human race, period. One, Christ died for all mankind. We have the same blood whereby we've been saved. We have the same blood flowing within us. We are to be children of God, he says, declared of the Most High God, righteous in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, here's what's happening. Go ahead and preach the gospel. Talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. Absolutely necessary. People that don't receive it, they enter into the tribulation period. They'll remember. Wait a minute. Graves are opened. The church people that I knew that were believers, now I'm not just classify people that are in the church doesn't mean that they're saved unless you're actually in the church body, which Jesus Christ said is my body. You've been saved through Jesus Christ. You wouldn't save through some legality of, 
of a denomination and their philosophy. I've said this to numerous people in areas. That person, just because they're part of that situation, doesn't mean that they're unsaved. They just haven't been saved through the doctrine of that organization. Because that doctrine of that organization does not preach salvation through Jesus Christ and Him only. So we find out here as we jump down to our next scripture, I want you to look at this. It mentions here in the book of Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, this is where pastors are today. This is what I'm talking about regarding the apostasy of the church. He says, Woe unto the pastors that destroy, destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Woe unto them. You know what? You're creating a greater turmoil. You're driving people away from me. You're trying to bring up this legality, this legal system whereby they will be accepted if they straighten themselves out. I sent my son in behalf of each one of them as well as you to take away your sins so that middle wall of partition could be torn down and you would have a way, he says, right into the Holy of Holies that's only given to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man can even tear that bell. That bell is a hand breadth thick. It was torn from the top of the bottom to the bottom, he says, signifying that the way of the Holy of Holies is now open, he says, through the blood of Jesus Christ for you to come in and to have very, the very presence of God. You could actually be in His presence forever. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. This is what he was saying during the days of Jeremiah. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them. I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Exactly what we see with the nation of Israel today. No longer a desolate land, but a land, he says, that's flowing truly with milk and honey. A land that's even supplying the European continent with most of its produce or with its fruit. Bountiful harvest coming from the blessings of the Lord. A rich area is said that once was barren. He goes on to say this. Jeremiah 23, 4, and I will set up shepherds over them. Now, God says, I will set up shepherds over them. Notice this part. This is the way God operates. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. They are not being actually preached to in a fearful, condemning way to try to bring them lower than the platform whereby the pastor stands to keep them in subjection so that I can pay my staff, I can pay my mortgage, I need to keep you right here locked in. This is a prideful thing. I need to have these people under me and my grip so that I can do whatever I might do. And that's the reason why God says I'm opposed to all of that. This isn't about your mortgage. This isn't about your building. This isn't about your staff. This is about lost souls. Let's go into the streets, he says, the byways and the highways of life and call these people to the wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say this. He says, They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Five, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto them, unto David, a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, Jesus Christ, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. He's the Lord, Jehovah Zekinu. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. When are the games going to stop? When is this playing around? Don't you know that God knows the very, not only the thoughts, but the intent, he says, of the heart. He knows why you're saying it, what motivates you to say it, what you're bringing about is many times fear, tactics, control, manipulation, and you're not presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say this in the 7 and 8, but I'm not going to read 7 because 8, I'm just going to briefly tell you that 80 says, I will bring them back into their land where they will dwell permanently. Let's jump down to our next scripture right here. He says in Jeremiah 31, 3, and this shall be the covenant. This is the new covenant whereby he says, it's no longer an if covenant. It's an I will covenant. God has done it because you can't do it. It's not under the Mosaic covenant 
It's even what Abraham was given as a covenant. Because you believed on me, he says, you were saved, you were blessed. He says, but this shall be the covenant that I will. Notice the I will, I will. There's another I will. And this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their heart, or inward parts, and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they, he says, shall be my people. 34 says this. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. But they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, God said, I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. God will forgive their iniquity, even though you might still remember their iniquity. Or you may say that they're still in iniquity. God said, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. What is their identity? Their identity is not based upon or nor defined based upon the iniquity that you see this person involved in. It's based upon what God says about them. I've remembered it no more. God said, I will remember it no more. That's what he says. Let's go down here to the next scripture. We're going to finish up here in just a second. I want you to jump all the way down here with me to the book of Romans. Go down to the book of Romans. We're going to close with this. Romans, the 15th chapter. I want to read 8 through 13. Romans 15, 8 through 13. Notice this, now I say that Jesus Christ, this is Paul speaking, under the dispensation of grace, Paul's ministering under the dispensation of grace, you'll see that this dispensation is mentioned three or four times by Paul, but I want you to understand that this is whereby you and the same dispensation of grace you and I are involved in. We're speaking, he said, about this. This is what Paul was all about. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Jesus Christ was a minister to the people of Israel. He was a minister to the circumcision, minister to the Jews. For what? For the truth of God. He ministered to the Jews the truth of God. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 9 says this, and that the Gentiles might glorify God. So here we are included, praise God. We have Jew and Gentile alike, neither bond nor free, male nor female. He says, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. I mean, can can we spend some time glorifying God for His mercy? Can we thank God for His unspeakable gift, Jesus Christ? His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. This is what Paul said. I will confess. I will declare this word among the Gentiles. I will sing unto your name. And again he says, saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. With the children of Israel, rejoice with them. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our salvation. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. Twelfth verse. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles Trust. We shall trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then he says this, 14. Did you have that? I'm sorry, I was stopping at 13. That's good. Let's read this again. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Now I I have the joy of the Lord who is my strength. Now let me tell you something. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I want you to look at it this way. Realize that God is, he's the joy of the Lord. And when you know what he thinks about you, what he says about you, how you identify you, that's your strength. What stops you? What causes you? What what brings you down? What tears you down? I walk in the boldness of Jesus Christ. I know my identity. I know the authority that I've been given. You know that when Jesus is talking about, Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, well, some people say that you're you know, a prophet or maybe Elijah or something like that. He said, no, but who do you say that I am? He says, you're Jesus you're the Son of God. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. He says, but my Father which is in heaven. And he says, heaven and earth shall... I mean, he says there, he says, all power has been given unto you. He says that the gates of hell will not even prevail against you. But I want you to think about this part. When he gets finished with the gates of hell shall not prevail against you, anytime you attack any type of a, a fort, you realize the gates were the weak points. We find out that he says the gates of hell, the power of that entire city will not prevail against the church. But I want you to... Listen to this in closing. 
What you, because we are kings and priests. Kings means you have dominion over the physical. Uh, priests means you have dominion over the spiritual. He says that what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Think about your words. When you, when you speak something out in the name of Jesus, what you bind on earth, God says, I'll bind it in heaven. What you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. What are you binding? What are you loosening? Speak over the situations that you say around you in the name of Jesus, realizing God has given you authority. He tells us, he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Church, speak. Speak in the name of Jesus. God will bind on earth what you bind in heaven, or will bind in heaven what you bind on earth, will loose on earth heaven what you loose on earth. Everything. It's powerful. Think about that scripture. And let's go before him in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today for truly how awesome you are. I thank you, God, for your faithfulness. I thank you, God, for all that you've done for us as your children. And I praise you, God, that we're children of the Most High God. We are already seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank you, God, for your marvelous faithfulness, for your word of truth, for your righteousness, for everything that prevails over our life, God, in the spiritual realm because of your great love towards us. God, I just pray that you will minister to us the love of God so that we just might have it flowing, our cup overflowing, that we might minister the love of God to other people. Instead of us, Lord, becoming angry about situations, I pray, Father, we'll see things through your eyes, your deep compassion, your tremendous love, the blessings of God being upon us, Pray, Father, that you'll just open our eyes to see things in the reality of the spiritual realm. Father, when we walk out of here, we realize that there's always more on our side than there is against us. You've given your angels charge concerning us, Lord. This place is even filled with your angels over each one of us that you've given charge to. Be with that person. Protect that person. Jesus, you're with every single one of us, so we give you glory for that. I pray that, Father, our walk today will be filled with tremendous blessing to realize who's on our side and for us. And if you be for us, nobody can ever be against us. I give you glory and praise and honor for it all. I thank you for the rich blessings. We ask them all in the name of Jesus and through his blood. All of God's children said amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get on our feet. I'm going to ask.